And uh, actually what I want to do is take everything that Nick Humphrey says is essential and everything that Kevin O'Regan says is essential for phenomenal experience and just take that away. Um, and I'm going to do that as a philosopher uh, in a th thought experiment, uh, which is what philosophers sometimes do. Uh, so here's an outline. I'm going to uh, just introduce very quickly uh, Avicenna's flying man argument. So Nick went back to 1929, and he also cited Hume. <laughs> I'm going way, way back to around 1000 uh, AD uh, to Avicenna. I'm going to relate this uh, idea to the minimal self. I take the minimal self simply to mean the, um, the idea of phenomenal self-awareness. And um, here uh, I'll talk a little bit about the phenomenology of, the, of minimal self-awareness and then conclude by suggesting another, well, building upon Avicenna, another thought experiment, the super flying man. So philosophers have used both thought experiments and empirical experiments to inform the work uh, uh, for uh, or for further argument. And Avicenna uh, is really no exception here. Not only thought experiments, but real experiments. He conducted empirical medical research and published a work entitled The Canon of Medicine, uh, which was used in Western universities until the 16th century, so for a good number of hundreds of years. Um, the third volume of this work includes chapters on spinal cord injury, and I mention that uh, simply because I've been reading uh, a recent paper uh, on spinal cord injury by Salvatore Agliotti in Rome uh, and uh, his colleagues, and it address, this study addresses a question that is roughly similar to the one that Avicenna addresses in his thought experiment on the flying man. Uh, roughly, what does the body contribute to cognition? Agliotti's positive answer considers a broad range of cognitive capacities. In contrast, Avicenna gives a negative answer, but with a focus on just one narrow question about self-awareness, and specifically phenomenal, what some people would call pre-reflective self-experience. Uh, uh, this is sometimes uh, characterized as a minimal self, uh, which may include uh, the sense of ownership or the sense of mindness. So I'm going to take a shortcut and just talk about the minimal self, but again, what I mean by minimal self is a kind of uh, very basic self-awareness, a phenomenal self-awareness. This, uh, this is a question, I think, that has relevance to a number of things, uh, including, uh, you know, discussions of Buddhist conceptions of the no-self, um, but also to explanations of illusions, such as the rubber hand illusion, um, and also uh, in psychopathology, characterizations of certain uh, disorders, such as schizophrenia, uh, which is sometimes considered a self-disorder. So here is uh, Avicenna. In the 11th century, uh, at the end of the first chapter uh, of his book called Psychology, Avicenna argued that a newly created man would be self-aware even if he were floating in a void uh, and all his senses were disabled. His conclusion, he's really arguing in a certain way against Aristotle, um, so his conclusion, in contrast to Aristotle's view, seemingly, is that self-awareness is not bodily and is not an awareness that we get through the senses. So here's the way he puts the flying man argument in one of his texts. He says, one of us must suppose that he is created all at once and created as perfect uh, but with his sight prevented from seeing anything external to him. He is created hovering in the air or in the void in such a way that the air does not buffet him so that he would have to feel it. His limbs are separated so that they do not touch or meet or contact one another. He must then reflect as to whether he will affirm the existence of his self. He will not hesitate so his 
his uh, argument is that he will not hesitate to affirm himself to exist. He will not, however, affirm things exterior to his members, nor the hidden things of his interiors, uh, nor his soul, nor his brain, nor anything else extrinsic. He will affirm himself to exist, though he will not affirm the length or the width or the thickness of himself. And he continues, if in this situation he were able to imagine a hand or another limb, he would not imagine it as part of himself, nor as a condition for his self. As to the self whose existence he affirms, it is specific for it that it is identical to him and distinct from his body or his limbs, which he has not affirmed. Thus, the alert person has a way to be advised concerning the existence of the soul or self as something distinct from the body and a way by which he may understand it and be aware of it. Now, there is uh, some scholarly, dis scholarly dispute, as there always will be, around certain texts about, uh, here about the meaning of the word that, um, which uh, Kakua, for example, translates as self, and others uh, translate as essence. I'm going to simply bypass that kind of scholarship. But uh, there, I think there is general agreement that Avicenna designed the flying man uh, experiment to argue that being aware of ourselves is independent of the body or any further content of experience. Here's a second very brief uh, statement of the argument. Again, if you imagine yourself to be created at birth, fully mature, sound in mind and body, but suspended in temperate air in such a manner that this self is totally unaware of its body and physical circumstances, you would be ignorant of the existence of the whole of your organs. You would be unaware of everything except the fixedness of your individual existence. Avicenna states that this self-awareness is a constituent of the self and belongs to it always and in actuality. A form of, nat he calls it, natural knowledge that does not depend on contact with another human being. We have some more recent uh, philosophers who have talked about the mineral self. Uh, Galen Strawson, for example, um, who uh, spoke at this conference back in Tucson a good number of years ago uh, about the minimal self. Um, Strawson uh, thinks of the minimal self as a mental subject of experience, but not as persistent as Avicenna allows. He thinks of it as lasting only about three seconds and then getting replaced by another minimal self. Dan Zahavi, uh, a phenomenologist, thinks uh, about a basic self-awareness of experience um, that can be completely irrelational, and this is how he characterizes the uh, minimal self. So there are a number of different versions of what we call minimal self. Um, there are three debates that might help us sort of uh, give us some focus on what we mean by minimal self. The first is, uh, is uh, the question, uh, is the minimal self genuinely experiential? Or is it simply a kind of formal abstraction from some fuller experience? Now, Avicenna, Strawson, and Zahavi all agree that it is genuinely experiential. There is something like a phenomenal awareness of oneself in, in, in this minimal sense, and that it's not an abstraction. A second question. Does the minimal self involve social existence? And here, uh, again, um, I think Avicenna, Strawson, and Zahavi agree uh, that the answer is no, that we should not think of the minimal self as somehow or other socially uh, influenced in any way. But there is a de an ongoing debate about that, and there's a number of people, including Matthew Ratcliffe, Anna uh, Shanaka, uh, and uh, uh, Katrina Futopolo, who who argue, well, we really have to take the social as something very basic, and even the minimal self should be considered uh, in some way um, embedded within social relations. So in regard to social aspects of the minimal self, Zahavi argues that one should not read late developing transformations due to social contexts into the initial natural phenomenal state. 
So again, agreeing with Avicenna on that. Um, Shanaka and colleagues, however, argue that it's not a matter of late transformation. There are intersubjective interactions already uh, that exist between, for example, the fetus uh, in the womb and the mother. So they want to trace uh, even prior to birth um, a kind of intersubjective interaction of some sort that has an effect upon even our own primary sense of self. Um, Merleau-Ponty, uh, for example, talks about a kind of intercorporeity, and that seems to be what they are describing. Avicenna tries to short-circuit this issue by specifying the flying man as created all at once, um, or created fully formed at birth. As he said, perfect, although his definition of perfect is without the senses, um, which is not exactly perfect, I guess. Um, Here's a third question about the minimal self. Is the minimal uh, self embodied? And this sort of gets to the point uh, that Avicenna is trying to argue. According to the flying man argument, there is no explicit consciousness as of my body connected with my self-experience. Um, but that does not mean that such self-experience is disembodied in any real sense since indeed the man is flying, or sometimes it's referred to as the floating man argument. Flying or floating, that means the body is flying or floating in some fashion. What would we, um, what would, uh, sorry, what we would be experiencing in the flying man condition as, as we might uh, in a sensory deprivation experiment uh, may very well rest on proprioceptive and interoceptive processes even if we do not consciously recognize such processes as such, or as, say, belonging to our body. On the one hand, however, proprioception dissipates if the flying man does not move his limbs. Uh, and this, this happens to us sometimes. We wake up and we're not sure where uh, our, our foot is because uh, we haven't moved it recently. Uh, and you, uh, so proprioception sort of goes to sleep, so to speak, um, if, if you don't move. On the other hand, sensory deprivation experiments uh, suggest that interoception, so sensations connected with beating heart, respiration, also things like hunger, pain, and so forth, as we've just heard about, uh, is enhanced when one removes extrasensor, uh, and extrasensory input. So, I'm being quick here, here's a conclusion. And the conclusion involves perhaps building a, a slightly different thought experiment, the super, uh, super flying man. So, returning to the first debate, the flying man argument shows that Avicenna's minimal self is something experiential, but at the same time, a kind of an abstraction, a type of abstraction, even if not of the formal type. It's an abstraction because one has to set it up as a thought experiment where you remove everything that contextualizes human experience, including almost all embodied sensory experience. I say almost because there's still this issue about interoception, which in some sense I, I, I would think defeats uh, Avicenna's argument, at least the way he has set up his thought experiment. So the question is, could we also kind of knock out interoception? So it turns out that uh, interoception uh, depends to some extent upon processes uh, of the anterior insula, which integrates, as Craig puts it, all subjective feelings from the body and feelings of emotion. So the, the idea here might be we could uh, do some kind of intervention uh, and kind of knock out uh, the, the working of the, in, uh, the anterior insula, um, and, and then perhaps lose interoception. Except that there's a second source of interoception, um, and that has to do with sensations uh, generated at the skin and uh, uh, some somatosensory afferent projections. So there, perhaps, we would have to do some more surgery, right, uh, or something, uh, some kind of intervention to knock out uh, the somatosensory areas uh, and eliminate interoception altogether, if that's possible. Uh, 
In which case, we have something like a, a super flying man, so not only absent extraception, but absent introception uh, as well. Now the question is, would there still be minimal self-experience? And I take it this is where we come back to Nick uh, here, who I think would say no, um, right? And uh, I'm kind of leaning that way myself, but I thought I would leave that as a question for you uh, to, to decide on your own. Um, but keep in mind, I think, that uh, my experience is typically complex, involving many factors, uh, including bodily, social, and so forth. Uh, but if it also involves a minimal self-awareness, Avicenna, on the interpretation at least of Kakua, may be right, that in one's everyday life, one does not have knowledge of this minimal self-experience. It's something that we overlook very easily. But one can gain insight into it by engaging in certain practices, um, philosophical thought experiments, for example, or sensory deprivation experiments, perhaps phenomenology, or some forms of meditation, and so forth. Um, so we'd have to go to these types of um, uh, practices, let's say, yeah, in order to try to get an answer uh, to, to the question. In any case, uh, thank you. Thank you.